Hello fellow intelligent investors, my name is René Zalman and today I want to present different valuation methods that you can then use to value companies. Because clearly companies have been bought, bought and sold for centuries. And of course there must have been methods to come up with a fair value estimate that both parties could then agree on. So in this video I will discuss five different valuation methods and outline important concepts such as the distinction between price and value margin of safety, appropriate discount rates, as well as the difference between absolute and relative valuation. Because if you want to successfully pick individual stocks, a good understanding of these concepts and different valuation methods is certainly needed. So let's get started. Have you ever wondered how you can make your hard-earned money work for you? Have you ever dreamed of building generational wealth and leaving a legacy? My name is René Zellman and I'll teach you how you can manage and invest your money with confidence, a long-term vision and without losing your mind. Join me on my journey of intelligent investing and learn how smart people can compound their money effectively and accumulate wealth. Alright, I believe that in order to successfully pick individual stocks that can then return above average returns, Investors need to develop both qualitative but also quantitative analytical skills. And so of course investors need to be familiar with different valuation methods because those are the tools that allow investors to estimate the value of a company which in turn is a prerequisite to assess the long-term returns of your investment as well as the risks involved. And while the tools themselves are rather quantitative in nature, your inputs at least in the more sophisticated valuation methods, require qualitative judgment. But we will get to this later. So in the introduction I said that I will present five different valuation methods. But as I didn't want to do a one hour long video, I decided to actually do a video series on this subject. And I will cover one to two valuation approaches in each video. So this is going to be the first video of this video series. And I will discuss the first valuation method in this video. And to give you a bit of an outlook here, I will, I will present the following five valuation methods. Firstly, I will discuss valuation multiples. In a, th in a second step, I will then take a look at relative valuation approaches. In a third step, I will discuss the advantages and disadvantages of a traditional discounted cash flow method. Fourthly, I will take a look at a probabilistic discounted cash flow method. And finally, an exit multiple DCF. So if you want to learn more about these approaches and want to become a better investor, be sure, to, be sure to subscribe to my channel. If you just like the video or leave a comment, that would also be much appreciated as it would truly help me to grow the channel. So let's start with our first valuation method. You can estimate whether a company is expensive or cheap right now with the help of so-called valuation multiples or a synonym would be valuation ratios. Basically, most valuation ra ratios look pretty much the same. You are incorporating the stock price or maybe the entire market cap or even the enterprise value of a company. And then you evaluate it to some other metric like a firm's profit or cash flow. And these simple ratios can then help you to identify how cheap a business is or how expensive it is. And in a way, you can think of valuation multiples as valuation shortcuts because most valuation multiples do not require any higher math. In fact, I think a fifth grader could calculate them. So let me maybe just illustrate this concept with the help of the mother of all valuation multiples, the price to earnings ratio or in short, the uh, PE ratio. The current stock price is the numerator of this ratio and current earnings per share can be found in the denominator. So if a company is currently trading at $50 a share and its earnings over the last 12 months were $4 per share, then the PE ratio for the stock would be 12.5, $50 divided by $4. Alternatively, you could also take a look at the entire market capitalization of the company and divide it by the annual net income of the firm. Put differently, to buy a company trading for a PE of 50, you'd have to pay 50 years of current earnings. If the company does not grow, you would have made your money back after 50 years. Now, generally speaking, low multiples indicate cheapness and might offer buying opportunities to intelligent investors as they indicate unjustifiably high discount rates. Again, try to think of multiples as shortcut valuations. Multiples can be considered a back of the envelope calculation and used to quickly come up with a ballpark estimate. 
So broadly speaking, as the PE ratio goes up, it shows that the current investor sentiment is favorable and investors are willing to pay a higher price. By contrast, a declining PE is an indication that the sentiment is turning bearish. Now, the PE ratio is only one of many valuation ratios. In fact, valuation multiples have evolved over time. Traditional valuation measures would certainly include the price to book ratio, the already mentioned price to earnings ratio, and maybe you could also mention a firm's dividend yield in this context. Today, you might also encounter a number of other valuation multiples, such as enterprise value to EBITDA, enterprise value to operating income, price to free cash flow or price to sales. But again, most follow the same pattern of using the stock price in the numerator and some kind of profit metric in the denominator. You could also swap the numerator and the denominator and turn the price to free cash flow ratio, for instance, into the free cash flow yield. Some multiples use a firm's enterprise value, or in short EV, in the numerator instead of a company's market capitalization. The enterprise value basically considers the market capitalization of a company, but also short-term and long-term debt, as well as any cash on the company's balance sheet. Put differently, if you would buy the entire company and pay the enterprise value price, no one would hold any financial claim on the company. What investors need to realize, I think, is that if you buy a company, you are essentially also buying the company's debt. You maybe don't have to pay it upfront, but you will have to pay for it eventually. And that's why I think intelligent investors should always favor enterprise value over market cap. Now, moreover, it is also worth pointing out that some valuation multiples, such as the price to book ratio, will have slightly different items in the denominator. In contrast to other valuation ratios, price to book uses a balance sheet item in the denominator, and it uses a firm's equity. Most other valuation ratios use either an item taken from the income statement or the cash flow statement. I can only encourage you to take a look at my ultimate book value guide video to learn more about this classic valuation multiple and its strength and its weaknesses. What's important to understand is that there are not only different valuation ratios, but also different variations of one and the same valuation multiple. If we use the PE ratio as an example here to illustrate this, then we can distinguish between PE ratios that are based on the last fiscal year, trailing PE ratios, and forward-looking PE ratios. The traditional PE ratio relies on a firm's fiscal year. And a fiscal year is basically a 12-month period that companies use for accounting purposes. For some firms, a fiscal year may end in March. For others, maybe it may end in October. And still others might release the annual report in July. By contrast, the trailing PE ratio is based on the last four quarters added together. A short form for these trailing valuation ratios that you might encounter on financial websites would be TTM for trailing 12 months or LTM for last 12 months. And then there are also forward-looking valuation multiples. The forward PE ratio, for instance, divides the current share price of a company by the estimated future earnings per share. A short form for this might be NTM for next 12 months. But as a rule of thumb, I would suggest that you should always approach forecasted metrics like forward PE ratios with a lot of caution. If I consider valuation multiples, for example, I don't consider all of the forward-looking metrics published on financial websites. I would much prefer to use my own growth estimates. Now, as we have already stressed, you can think of valuation ratios as a shortcut valuation approach. And as such, this approach obviously suffers from some major limitations. In fact, all of the valuation methods that we will talk about in this video series have their limitations. And I think it's important to understand those disadvantages or limitations. So in this video, we won't discuss all of the issues of valuation multiples. But in this video, I want to stress the biggest one, maybe. Most importantly, most valuation ratios don't consider a firm's future growth. But intelligent value investing is not buying low PE stocks. In fact, a stock trading at a P of 25 might be cheaper than a stock trading at a PE of 10. If the market has attributed a low PE ratio to a company 
or maybe even a group of companies. There may be very good reasons for that. And I think once you have watched my follow-up videos in this video series, especially the one on the discounted cash flow method, you will understand why it's important to consider future growth when trying to find investment opportunities that are at trading at a big discount. So again, make sure to hit the subscribe button and to hit the bell icon so that you won't miss these future videos. So as I just said, valuation multiples do not consider a firm's growth. That's why Peter Lynch's PEC ratio is also worth mentioning in the context of this video. Compared to other ratios, the PEC ratio is quite unique because it factors in growth. It is calculated by dividing the PE ratio by the earnings per share growth rate. And again, there's a ratio called trailing PEC that is using trailing growth rates and forward pack that obviously is using forward looking growth rates. And generally there is so much more to a business and a stock beyond a simple PE ratio. The multiple, multiple itself for instance doesn't tell you anything about the growth prospects of a business. It doesn't tell you anything about the quality of management, the competitive position of the corporation or the returns of capital of the firm. This is where your qualitative judgment comes into play that I have mentioned previously. And that's why a fair price is only one of the five major pillars in my investment framework. Nonetheless, I believe that a valuation multiple can be a good starting point. It can be used for a snap judgment to decide whether you want to take a closer look at the company. And that's how I use them. With a little experience, you can also get a feel for whether an EV to free cash flow ratio of 20 is expensive or not based on the firm's past growth and maybe also the future growth that one can expect. Now, lastly, there is one more topic we need to touch on in the context of valuation multiples. And that's how multiple expansion in a positive way, as well as multiple contraction or multiple compression in a negative way can affect your investment returns. In previous videos of mine, I have outlined that investors' returns is usually made up of three components. We have free cash flow yield, internal business growth, and then lastly, there's also multiple expansion. So let us have a closer look at the last component here. Basically, when an investor sells a stock for a higher multiple than the multiple he or she originally paid, the growth in that multiple is called multiple expansion. Buying a company for five times earnings and selling it for 20 times earnings would be an example of multiple expansion. You essentially quadrupled your money without any business growth. And to illustrate this, consider a fictional company that earns $100 annually. Its PE is 10 and therefore the market cap of the entire company would be $1,000. Let's say the company doesn't grow, but if in 10 years there is an interested buyer who is willing to pay $2,000 for the firm, the business owner benefited from an expansion of the multiple. The company is still earning $100 annually, so the fundamentals of the business did not change. But nonetheless, the original owner enjoyed an annual return of roughly 7%, as he could sell the firm at a PE multiple of 20. Now, some of you might be wondering what might cause such a multiple expansion, or maybe also a multiple compression. But let me focus on the expansion part here. Well, I think there are all sorts of reasons for this. Maybe the business was selling for a PE of 10 when everyone else was panic panicking and therefore was driving down the multiple. Maybe interest rates were falling over the course of the last 10 years, which generally leads to higher valuations. Maybe the industry has become more pep popular and triggered a change of the narrative. Maybe the company was very small 10 years ago and underfollowed and was discovered by new investors now. All of these are reasons that could lead to an expansion of the multiple. Actually, we cannot only observe multiple expansion or compression on the level of individual companies, but also on an industry or market level. For instance, if we take a look at the PE ratio of the S&P 500, that's the biggest 500 companies in the United States, which is calculated by dividing the current S&P market cap by trailing 12 month earnings of all S&P 500 companies. Well, if we take a look at the following graph, we can see that the ratio increased over the last 10 years. Again, a form of multiple expansion. As a rule of thumb, one could say that in the short term, valuation multiples are the primary driver of stock performance. But in the long term, business growth and increase of intrinsic value is the primary driver of stock performance. 
business growth is also much easier to predict and that's why I think investors should focus on the business fundamentals, the business quality first. And with that, I think I provided a pretty good overview of the first valuation method being valuation multiples. Now, of course, we could take a look at individual multiples here and discuss the advantages and disadvantages of the PE ratio, for instance, but the video is already quite long and I think we should wrap it up here. So may your finances and investments prosper. Good luck. Uh -huh.